Hello and welcome to Podcrash. Uh, our guest this week is uh, Theo Boss, uh, one of the biggest sporting personalities in Holland. He's been a professional cyclist for 19 years, I think. Uh, one of the few riders to successfully compete in track sprint as well as Grand Tour racing. Five times world champion, Olympic silver medalist, and uh, and actually one of my kind of sporting heroes when I was growing up through the sport. Always loved seeing a little tussle between uh, between Theo and Chris. Hello. So welcome. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Nice. Uh, so Phil, have you got any news to kick off? Um, not got many news. Just been training in my home gym and been on Swift a few times. So I'm gonna try and go on it every day so far. Um, I saw you. Uh, I saw you posted a one-hour ride and said it's the longest road ride you've done this year. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do much road. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, my my news is I still don't have COVID, despite apparently being diagnosed with it uh got the stitches out my knee five things is back up and running so that's exciting isn't it phil it's never been up and running in the first place <laughs> so yeah but now it's extra up and running um but yeah not not too much news because we had a bit of a gap with the last one uh so teo um so your older brother was a pro speed skater um obviously in holland there's a big connection between speed skating and cycling um which we don't have so much in the uk um but yeah so how did you kind of find yourself getting into the sport and did you do any kind of speed skating as well um yeah i started cycling when i was nine um and my brothers they did cycling and speed skating and um yeah one of my brothers he was uh yeah a professional speed skater and he went to uh, he went to uh, Olympics in Nagano, 98, 2002, Salt Lake City, 2006, uh, Torino, and 2010, Vancouver. And also uh, Athens uh, Olympics, he did as a cyclist, as a starter for the team sprint. Nice. And um, so he, uh, he's like uh, eight years older than me. So he was always an uh, yeah, uh, example for me when he was training and, and everything. And... Uh, yeah, when you go to races from him, cycling or speed skating, you want to also compete. And so I started uh, I started doing cycling in the beginning, and then when I was a little bit older, also speed skating. Um, and in when I was junior, I decided to go only for uh, for cycling, so I quit speed skating. Um, but you see many, yeah, uh, of course, uh, in the winter, speed skating is a big sport in Holland. And in the summer, many speed skaters they keep fit or do a lot of base training on the on the road bike on the road. So yeah, the training is really good to combine. Yeah, we had um, Danny Khan in the UK who did a bit of speed skating before that as well. So there's a little bit of it in the UK, but um, I think after BMX, it's probably the most common sport which sprinters end up transferring from. Uh, what what made you what made you end up picking picking one over the other? Um, yeah, speed skating is very technical sport um and uh if you have if you don't have a super good technique um yeah your times won't be super fast and um and at the same time I, my technique was was good um but i preferred to do a sport where technique wasn't that important like cycling <laughs> 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 it's just uh, ramming on the pedals and um and I, actually, I was also better at uh, cycling than at speed skating. So when I was junior, I was like uh, at one year, important year for when you're juniors, a third of, from Holland in sprint. Um, yeah, that's good. But yeah, not maybe not good enough to become professional. And at that time, I did also uh, junior worlds. I become world champion uh, junior one kilometer. And uh, I, I was able to, yeah, to go to the national team and ride World Cups and everything with uh, with the national team already. And I did also Worlds as a junior in Antwerp, 2001. So yeah, when you roll into that world, uh, you don't want anything else, and you want to become good at that. And uh, so yeah, that's how it evolved, basically. Phil, uh, you grew up near the Dutch border. Did you ever try a bit of speed skating? I did actually, yeah. No, did you? Did yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was an ice ring not far from um, from where I live, so I've, I've given it a go. Had like ten sessions at it. Oh really? Yeah. <laughs> what track was that? What what city? Um, I can't remember. 
near me. I'm, I live like um, <laughs> what was it called? It was in Germany or it was in Holland. In Germany, yeah, but near the Dutch border. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know? Uh, has Phil ever told you what he thinks about the Dutch near the near the Dutch border, Theo? <laughs> you, no. <laughs> what is it? What is it? <laughs> Well, you made a joke about the number plates, Phil. Yeah, there's the, there's the old German um, joke uh, that if you fail your driving license, you get an orange number plate, which the Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. That's yeah. a good one. You can give it back to him at any point. He's got no feelings. It's fine. Um, but yeah, so you you kind of like burst onto the scene like like pretty young because you won your first world champs in spin in, at, at 21 years old, which is like super super impressive and like i think from like a, a physical point of view you were still quite like skinny back then as well and didn't kind of get to your kind of full size but like that that's a pretty quick rise to the top i guess yeah that's very strange uh actually i was 20 when i win my first world title and uh when i in 2001 i went um for junior worlds uh, or the first time i went to junior worlds was in 2000 in uh, italy and um, there I was uh, like still a road rider um, and I was riding team pursuits and also just kilometer for fun and sprint for fun. But I yeah, kind of like sprint and kilometer more than team pursuit. So I said, okay, next year at Junior Worlds, I want to go for kilo. And, um, and then 2001, you start doing a little bit more gym and, and work specific on kilo and then I won. And also a few weeks later, um, yeah, the, the, the national coach asked me, okay, in a, in a few weeks, there is a World Cup in Mexico City. Do you want to ride there? And if you go there, you can maybe qualify for World's Seniors in Antwerp. And uh, I was like, yeah, okay, uh, yeah, I want to go there. And uh, yeah, after the after Junior Worlds, I had to stay in, it was in T-Town. I had to stay there a couple of weeks and uh, they arranged some uh, family I can stay with and uh, still train on a the track there in T-Town. And uh, yeah, after a couple of weeks, I flew from New York to Mexico City. And there I did uh, I did a World Cup. Uh, I don't know which place I finished, 2 no one in one minute uh, something, one minute and five tenths or something. And I did 102.5. Which was yeah pretty cool time of course it was junior world record also at that time and um, yeah then I went to Antwerp uh, at senior worlds I finished ninth uh, on the kilo uh, and you know who was eighth eighth place that worlds one kilometer Chris oh. you don't know F uh, Los Craig <laughs> who Chris <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. Chris was eight. Was he? He'd be disappointed with that. <laughs> yeah. It was a very nice track in Antwerp. Um, um, and then, but then it's 2000, 2001, and then uh, yeah, you, I went to 2002 Worlds. I went a little bit faster. Uh, 2003, again a little bit faster. But in 2003, I was already very quick in 200 meter. Uh, I finished, I think, fifth or sixth in qualification. And uh, you know who was first in qualification, actually? <laughs> Chris? <laughs> Craig. Craig was first. Craig, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say Felix English, but that would hurt Chris too much. <laughs> <laughs> but this, this is 2003, yeah? Yeah. So, uh, and then, uh, so then I was already, yeah, pretty close. And uh, in 2004 Worlds, um, yeah, I tried to, yeah, to do a good kilo there. And uh, I finished third. In, uh, in in Melbourne and uh, uh, who won? Uh, Chris won, I think, two no a second. So I was pretty happy with that. And then the yeah, f a day after, or two days after sprint tournament, I, I won. So that was a big surprise. And but yeah, if you look back, uh, it went pretty quick to yeah, when you're 20, um, yeah, to become world sprint champion. I would I never expected that. That was a big surprise mm -hmm. for me. I guess maybe, the way through, yeah. maybe maybe kilo was a was a good chance for me because I yeah I never expected I I would be a sprinter because I wasn't built like a sprinter I had yeah good endurance um, 
yeah, I was more built for a kilo. I get, Phil, I guess that's kind of the same thing with you and, and London. Like you were kind of just chucked in the deep end all of a sudden and then you've got a major result. Like like what what was that like for you and then and then Tio to suddenly have that success? Um, I don't know. It just comes quickly, doesn't it? Like like everything happened so quick. Like it was only like a year and a half before that where I was riding for Germany in the Junior World Championships, scraping a bronze medal. And then a year and a half later, or two years later, you win the Olympic gold medal. But I think... This just was just like a sudden spike in form, and then you get put into the A team as well. That was for me. Um, suddenly, like someone, like the team believes in you, and you, you, you know you have to um, do your best. Riding with Chris, who was already won three gold medals at the time, so um, yeah, it was I don't know, yeah. And and then too, um, I d I didn't realize actually before that it's interesting you did load cycling when you were growing up because of course later in your career you you load for the likes of like Savello, NTN, all that kind of stuff as as a plotter or rider. Um, but when you left speed skating, did you did you immediately go to splinting or was there a gap in between where you did mainly load cycling then on to splint? Yeah, so until Junior Worlds in two thousand in Italy, I was a road rider, and um, yeah, I did yeah classics everything when you when you're jun junior. Uh, yeah, and you live almost like a professional, uh, even when you are 15, 16 years old. Um, so, uh, yeah, I was a very much endurance rider then. Did you win um, any big races then? Sorry? Did you win any big races as a junior? Road races? As a junior, yes. I won uh, yeah, in Holland. It's all it's flat, so it's always yeah. a bunch sprint, so, which is good for me. You know, so I won... When I was 15, 16, I won a lot of races on the road mm. already. Um, and I was also uh, trained by uh, trainers from Rabobank. So they had like a special uh, program. They, they pick up young riders and they help them developing uh, themselves. Um, so I was always already on the radar uh, with Rabobank team. And um, But in the end, uh, yeah, I decided to just do what I liked most and that was the track um, and I wanted to see how good I can become and at that time also my trainer from Rabobank he was a um, uh, he was a national coach for triathlon and uh, he went to Sydney Olympics in triathlon and he was also the track there and he said yeah the one kilometer that's perfect event for you so he said he advised me to go to Athens to try to go to Athens and to the Olympics and try to become a kilo rider. And, um, yeah, the, I tried and, uh, but at the same time during Athens, uh, I, I still was in contact with him and, uh, Rabobank wanted me to try the road, uh, again at that time. So try to go to, uh, under 23, uh, Rabobank team and to try the road again. Um, but yeah, that was too early for me. And I said, okay, I want to go to Beijing first and, um, yeah, try to, to become, uh, yeah, to win more races on the track. And, but we always get kept in touch. And then after Beijing, I decided to do it anyways. So, so w when you were a kid, did you, did, was your, was your kind of ultimate passion to go to the Olympics or was it to like win a Tour de France or something like that? Because when you're that age, like people tend to dream a little bit. Yeah, the, when I was a kid, I always wanted to be a road rider, yeah. and uh, I I never I didn't know track that much. I just started learning track um, maybe ninety nine two thousand when I and the first real track event I watched was the Manchester World Championships in two thousand, the legendary World Championships. <laughs> <laughs> what actually pulled you into track cycling? Um, yeah, in the end, it's it's not about uh, it's not about the money. Of course, you need to yeah, you need to make a certain amount of money. Um, but yeah, the most important thing I think is uh, that you just do what you like. You know, if you don't really like road cycling, um, and you have to do go through all this training efforts and 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 races on the road, uh, you also have to do less nice road uh, road races. Uh, you have to race in the rain. If you don't really enjoy that, um, the life as a road rider, then yeah, the, the money isn't worth it, you know? It's a hard life, yeah. isn't it? I yeah. couldn't do yeah, it. Yeah, it's a hard life. But you see also a lot of road riders 
they they are good, um, but they don't really like it anymore. But they still get offered a very good salary. Mm. So yeah, they offered a new contract for two years. I don't know, maybe uh, 150 grand a year or 200 grand a year. Um, so they continue because they are good and because of the money. But yeah, you can see they don't. They are almost depressed. You know, they don't like it anymore. Mm. But they continue because of the money, and that's. I don't think that's a that's a very good motivation. But it's also hard to say no to that kind of money, of course. Yeah. Well, Phil. Phil. Phil was a provider for one year. I was. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't get any. You were didn't... what? I was a pro rider for one year for Team Wiggins. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, but well, I didn't get paid anything and I didn't race anything. <laughs> I was okay, just the mascot. Okay. <laughs> do, do you know the, the, the best bit was that um, they wanted to get a spot on the team for Kian Amadi, um, but because Phil was on there doing nothing, they couldn't find any space for Kian. <laughs> to be fair, I was, oh, okay. probably, I was probably as useful as Kian Amadi would have been. So... <laughs> <laughs> He's terrible. You did, uh, you did not even one do one road race. No, I don't think anyone did any road races then. That was um the year of uh 2016. I think there was just a track team and then okay. the all road um two of Britain yeah. after. Yeah. F- Phil, you were talking about doing the uh Phil, you were talking about doing the team time trial world championships. Yeah, but I don't think they even entered in the end. <laughs> 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 what man won in Doha? Yeah, I think the plan was to, for me to go first K and then just drop out. <laughs> no, I think I think one kilometer is a bit ambitious for you, mate. Yeah, it's a bit too long. <laughs> <laughs> um, so obviously, to going back to your kind of career and progression and stuff like that, obviously you kind of did go on to to Athens, um, picking up a kind of silver medal there. Um, I guess did from from that point on, you know, I think a lot of people end up winning like a silver medal, and it gives them even more motivation to keep pushing on for the next time of loans. Um, what kind of place were you sitting at about that point in your career? Um, yeah, so yeah, I got uh, talks with uh, with the Rabobank team to go on the road, but still, I had the ambition to to win a gold medal at the Olympics, and uh, yeah, that was the goal for for Beijing, uh, just to try to get a, a gold medal there. Um, and in the meantime, yeah, every year you have world championships just to to get world titles, you know, and defend your world title. And um, yeah, that was my uh, yeah four year actually. And in the end, uh, uh, every year I got better and better, and uh, I got uh, ahead of because in Athens, um, Ryan Bailey was the yeah was the best sprinter there. He won mm-hmm. the Kieran in the sprint. Uh, was also pretty close in the sprint. Uh, between us um but after athens he yeah kind of lost the shape of athens and uh, he never really got to that level anymore um uh, and i got better after athens uh, and then i was ahead of everyone else uh, during that time you know uh, i i won a sprint uh, kirin a kilometer um so yeah that was going really well but uh, yeah, after 2006, maybe my best shape ever uh, in Bordeaux. I won the sprint in the Kirin. Yeah, after that, it looked like everyone was catching up every year to me. Um, so in the 2007 uh, Mallorca World Championships, I was uh, I was good. But uh, yeah, they were getting closer. Chris even won the Kirin there, um, and then yeah, Beijing or. Manchester World Championships 2008, yeah, all the riders were, were a lot of riders on the same level again. Um, I think it benefits me more than other guys who are much stronger than me in a gym board, for example. Mm. So yeah, I think uh, yeah, what we had there, we were still you know pioneering and uh, just uh, sometimes uh, yeah, we didn't even understand what we were doing, but it worked. And uh, we took what what was working, and uh, yeah, we used that again for the next year, you know. And we tried some new things uh, in training, for example. We feel it's not working, and we we threw it away. But we were just still um, looking for things to to get better, you know. And yes, sometimes uh, 
um, yeah, you find something and, and you use it, uh, you use it again. And um, so then, then we ended up going towards the kind of big event, which was the 2008 Olympic Games. And um, it, it seemed like this was an event with a lot of pressure on you. Like, I think when I was a, when I was a kid, I remember seeing like the whole kind of Koga bike release. Um, you know, you're doing a lot of media appearances and things like that. Did you feel as if there was a, there was a lot of pressure building up on you for 2008 Olympics? Yeah, of course, uh, you know, uh, the, the years before, uh, how to handle uh, those kind of things, you know, it's like... Um, um like the sponsor for example koga they made a new bike and um i was also paid by the sponsor and um yeah i was happy that you know companies they wanted to step into track cycling because um the years before me nobody even heard about track cycling you know so track cycling in holland was getting bigger and bigger and that was really a good thing i think because we also had many years that, yeah, n- n- nobody thought about track cycling, you know. So to make the sports be- bigger, uh, that was also what we need, you know. We don't have, we didn't have uh, a lot of funding from the government or from the Olympic Committee or from the Federation. We had to, yeah, if you want to bring budget or money uh, in the sport, it has to be, yeah, from companies, you know. So. Um, yeah, that is the thing, uh, you get, for example, Koga, they want to, they put money in the sport and that's a good thing. But like you say, yeah, also it brings sometimes pressure, you know, mm-hmm. and, um, not that, that it was, uh, crazy because, uh, I think in the end, an athlete also, um, has a pressure from himself, you know, and, uh, and that was maybe too, too much because, when I went there, I knew I had to have. Uh, I needed to. I needed to go for a gold medal. You know, that was the only thing that counted for me at that time, and that was maybe not a good uh, uh, state of mind. You know, to go to Olympics. Do you think that was the the downside of maybe not having older, more experienced guys in the team? Do you think that's where that kind of experience would have helped? Yeah, for sure, because when I think back now, I thought, okay, uh, my level was not super good there. Um, But I also felt like when you see training and everything, you see, okay, uh, the British, they go too fast. I cannot beat them, uh, you know, here at the Olympics. Um, That does something also with your head, you know. And, um, And now I would say, okay, just go for a, go for an Olympic medal, you know. Just it probably is not going to be gold, um, but just go for another medal, you know. But in the end, everything went wrong at that Olympics. Mm-hmm. I think for the British, everything went right, but uh, for the Dutch, everything went wrong. It was crazy Olympics. Yeah, well, everyone besides Mark Cavendish in that Olympics. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mark. Um, but yeah, so, so Mark, Mark was the only one without a medal, I think, or not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. I think I think someone had to lend him a medal to get in first class on the plane. <laughs> Everybody was Olympic champion, except for. Uh, except no. for Mark. We had Chris Newton in with bronze as well. Stephen Burke with uh, bronze. Um, uh, and Ross Ross Edgar was uh, silver medal. Silver, yeah. He snuck in there. Snuck in there. Um, Good one you say um you let yourself down mentally or, or or was there something going wrong wrong in the preparation as well or was it more that you seen the british uh, in training going fast and then mentally you just uh, I, my my uh, level wasn't uh, at my best yeah. so yeah that's also not really nice when you do your training and you, in your times are not super fast yeah uh, but still you have to fight of course uh for every spot you know and uh, that's what i did and uh, um, I got into the sprint quarterfinal, uh, but then I had the race uh, Bulgam, and then yeah, he was just uh, too fast for me. Um, and uh, so yeah, I knew my level wasn't super good, so that's also uh, difficult mentally. Mm. And uh, in the end, I knew okay, if I want to make a medal, it's gonna be at the Kirin. <laughs> It's gonna have to be, you know, uh, it has to be at the Kirin. 
and then in the, in the Kirin, uh, I crashed. <laughs> so uh, behind the behind the pace, so yeah, one guy clipped the wheel of another guy in front of him. He fell in front of me, and then uh, I just fell over. Then the race was done. You know, you cannot restart because it was after half lap or something. Um, so that was it. So yeah, then I knew okay, this is uh, not gonna. It's not going to be a nice story anymore. Mm. It's nothing to worry about. I mean, both you guys are crashed at Olympic Games. Um, but anyway, <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> sorry, Phil. So uh, basically what I was going to say was with, with the British, it seemed to a lot of people like the British kind of just basically burst onto the scene and started winning everything. Was that like a shock to the other nations and to the Dutch and to yourself? Uh, yeah, I because I had a certain for example i had a time in my head okay i want to do right 99 at 200 meter then uh, yeah for sure i can uh, you know I, I make a chance to become olympic champion and uh, yeah the world's before i always rode like 1005 1004 1003 uh, around that you know 10 low and uh, almost under 10 seconds and i thought okay at the olympics it must be possible you know to ride 99 and then uh, yeah uh, it's a good start to get the uh, get the gold medal, and then uh, yeah, you see uh, the British they ride uh, Chris Road uh, nine eight uh, or something like that, you know. Um, like I didn't even was I wasn't even thinking about that time, you know. Mm. <laughs> so um, yeah, that was crazy how fast they were going. It was in- incredible. You don't it even qualify with that time though. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> Yeah, that, that that time it was just super fast, and still, uh, I, not many riders I think can ride that time with that gear. You know, mm. it's just the gear that uh, gave him that time. If he just rode a massive gear like they do now, yeah, for sure he would go faster. Also, mm. so you know, um, you, you know, you've been in the sport for for so long. Do you do you sometimes like wish that you knew what you know now? about the gears about the speeds about the training you know because phil, phil just said it there you know it's like like 99 today wouldn't even qualify you for a world cup yeah 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 when you uh when you're an athlete you always think about okay i have to think about times we were going we are going to do in 20 years you know or in 10 years and you want to be ahead of ahead of your time and you're always looking for um, where to improve and you have to be very smart and creative with this and then maybe you can uh, you can be a step ahead of the competition but yeah in the end when you uh, when I you know for example see my bike or see my skin suit I was riding with or uh, yeah whatever the tires or whatever yeah you think shit man uh, so easy to make some gains with this you know and yeah we didn't do it at that time and that's just uh, not not so smart so yeah. and now you have to have in your head okay where can we improve just constantly and also now that the olympics is postponed one more year you have uh, another year of thinking yeah where can we improve again you know no for sure um, so, so after that kind of disappointment of the Olympics, that's when you decided to go to Rabobank. You decided to take them up on their offer. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, just directly after Olympics, uh, already I already decided to do it uh, basically before Beijing. And um, yeah, okay, uh, Olympics didn't go well, um, and I just started training a couple of weeks after, you know. So uh, just started doing road rides <laughs> <laughs> and how, how did you how did you find that transition because obviously you know more famously in the uk ross edgar attempted to switch from track sprinter into a road cyclist uh you know kia namadi seems to have managed to have done it um from sprint to individual pursuit on the track which isn't as big a jump but did you find the jump as as hard as maybe those two guys found it yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it, sometimes it was very hard, but sometimes it's also, yeah, easy, you know, um, because, uh, yeah, you also have uh, races that are um, not at a, a crazy high level. Uh, some races suit you really well, flat, fast. Um, and in the end, 
it's also yeah, not that complicated, you know. You just have to get the miles in. That's the most important thing. And uh, sometimes it's really boring. Maybe also at the same time, it's it's very hard. But yeah, if you're strong in the head and you just get your kilometers in the legs, um, yeah, and then you can see the result. And um, th- this is probably something that we've all heard. But you know, whenever I'm at like a, a sponsorship event, someone will come up to me and say, "Why don't you switch to riding the Tour de France?" And then my response is, well, because first of all, it's really hard. And second of all, because I, I don't think I'd be able to find a sponsor which would, which would look after me for, the, for those number of years to be able to start getting results because it takes so much time to build up. Did you, did you have a sponsor that, that kind of really looked after you or were you getting results quite quickly? Um, well, the, the, the directly the next year, 2009, I did road races. So I rode for Rabobank under 23 team. And, um, and, uh, yeah, so I did, uh, a lot of races and, uh, it went well. And then, uh, I got an offer from Cervelo test team for 2010, uh, to write for that team and also from Rabobank. And then, yeah, I decided to go to Cervelo and, uh, yeah, that was a very nice year already. Yeah. And how long did it take to go from being a, a track splinter to start picking up the Zolts in the Pro Tour? Half a year. Oh, in the really? <laughs> oh my God! Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, not not uh, not a half year for that, but uh, I won my first professional race. So I won some road races uh, with under twenty three. But I you you ride also pro races. Um, but my first uh, pro win was in two thousand ten um, in Clasica Almeria. It's a uh, yeah classic in in Spain. And uh, yeah, uh, before I rode Qatar. It's a very hard race uh, in in the crosswinds, and the week after I rode Classica Almeria and I beat the Cavendish in the sprint. So uh, yeah, that was uh, yeah one and a half year later. So you're genetically really gifted as well, because I can't even sit on the local bunch right here. <laughs> <laughs> it's just training, and I think also I started when I was a kid. I was a road rider, so if you do that until. Yeah, you're 16, 17. You also ride classics, you know, with uh, from 120 kilometers. So yeah, I I had that experience still, and uh, and then yeah, uh, also the, the 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 sprinters legs from the track, and then yeah, I had to get the base back in, and uh, lose a little bit of uh, muscle, um, and then I was I was good. Mm. Phil, you also did some pretty long road rides and races when you were a kid, so why can't you switch? I don't know. That's what I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> because I've, <laughs> I've done, I've done a few, well, I've, I've only done two years, really, of road racing. Um, and then when I was a junior, this is where I switched to um, sprinting. So I did one, like, classic, like, which, which was 90k long. And I got dropped. So I don't think I had it, had it in the first place. <laughs> Yeah, but I think it's it's good to put that into context of like how big a jump that is. Because Phil, I don't know what you say to people when they say to you, "Why don't you like the Tour de France?" But my response is like, it would take me so long to get there. I, I always say I compare it to Usain Bolt and uh, Mo, Mo Farah. Like one can run a marathon, one can only run ten seconds. So that's probably the best comparisons you can give to people yeah. to show the difference. Yeah. And. Uh, uh, Tio, here's a here's another question I get asked a lot by people at events. Um, you know, they always say like, okay, so y- you know, you and Cav, like, say myself and Cav, like, who's who's the fastest sprinter? They kind of want to know an answer to that. Um, d- do you think like a lot a lot of these guys that are kind of finishing, you know, top five uh, professional races have got the potential to be really talented sprinters on the track as well? Do you think it's actually not as far away as as Phil and I think in terms of discipline? Um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, but yeah, if you look at the, the Omnium riders, uh, if, and if you look at their flying laps, it's still really fast, you know? Mm. Um, I think in Rio, I, I don't know, Viviani, I don't know what, what lap time he did, but I think it was still really fast what he did. Um, but the, the biggest problem is the, is the start. So flying, flying efforts, I think they can, be good so maybe for example kieran um but yeah standing standing star that's that's something yeah completely different than road cycling i think 
And um, so obviously we we talked about you know the the wins that you had you know beating Mark Cavendish, uh, winning two stages at the Tour of Turkey. Um, but I have to ask you about something which went viral, um, which was the crash. Yeah. Um, where you picked up a ban off the back of it. Um, but this this video went all over the internet for months, I think. Uh, so, so what's your kind of recollection of of that kind of famous crash where uh, Dalo Impi ended up in in the barrier? Um, yeah, that was in Turkey, and uh, I had um, uh, it was the last stage, and uh, yeah, it was going to be a bunch sprint. And at one uh, at one moment, just uh, I don't know, a couple of hundred meters for the for the finish, I was just boxed in, and um, I was getting really close to the barriers. And at one moment, I I started to fall into the barriers, and uh, yeah, as a re- reaction, I I hold. Uh, he was riding next to me. Yeah, I tried to stay upright and I hold him. And uh, yeah, I crashed and I yeah I dra- dragged him with me. <laughs> but I crashed. Uh, yeah, basically. Uh, yeah, you know the barriers they have these little mm-hmm. legs. And uh, yeah, I my front wheel hit one of the legs and I crashed. And um, I was also already yeah in a gap that wasn't really there. Um, so that was a big mistake for me. Um, and then, yeah, I crashed and I, yeah, tried to keep upright, holding, uh, myself on, onto him. No, fair enough. And, and that brings up an interesting question as well about like, when is a gap too small? So, you know, obviously in queuing, it's all about getting into like small gaps and trying to get away with it. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Which, which of the two sports would you say are more close in that instance um yeah i I think the road is much more dangerous than um than the than the kieran um like sometimes yeah in the road you have a lot of uh, things uh corners uh barriers uh i don't know uh uh, a lot of road furniture cars where you can crash (laughs) crash on and uh, at the same time you have like uh, in a bunch sprint maybe 50 guys who want to stay in the front um, and yeah sometimes uh, you know you're riding with a team and you have to follow your team and um, yeah and, and then you come uh, in a sandwich for example with uh, with other teams and uh, yeah you're making a, a, a decision to go through it for example and uh, because you have to follow your team, that's what you uh, what the plan is with the team. You know, you have to stay with the, the rider, your lead out guy, for example, and he can maybe squeeze through. But uh, yeah, then the gap is closed. But you you still want to follow. And in the final, sometimes you go for it, and it's yeah, it can be really dangerous, of course. And uh, yeah, a lot of times you have pressures like with with this, and that happens to me also. And that's the main reason why Phil isn't actually a road rider because he's very scared of crashing. <laughs> I don't like sitting. In, I like I like queuing up in traffic. Now, to be fair, after I've got so much stick from you guys, I started filtering through. But I like to be safe. Phil won't go up the inside. He'll just sit behind the car until the car moves. So is that is that good or not? Yeah, it's good. No, it's it's safe. Like he's safe. He's driving on a bike. Okay, it's yeah. safe. <laughs> yeah, we have we we have cycling paths, so that's uh, that's a good thing in Holland. Yeah, yeah, that's good. And then, so like, kind of. Where did the decision come after you know being with Rabobank, Savello, NTN um, to switch back to the track again? Well, I was uh, riding in, uh, in 2015 for uh, MTN, and uh, yeah, I was uh, yeah kind of finished with uh, with road cycling, and uh, I had a few bad crashes, um, and I did some yeah in the meantime also some track races, but not not crazy crazy much, you know. Like I did 2011, I did. Uh, World's Medicine. Uh, I did some European Championships, stuff like that. And um, uh, and then in 2015, um, yeah, I did some more track track racing, and I did also the Team Sprint uh, Nationals with uh, with my old uh, training buddies and uh, 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 racing uh, colleagues, uh, Tom Mulder and Tim Pelt, and. Um, um, yeah, uh, we did uh, quite good, and I thought, oh shit, it's uh, it's quite nice actually to do a team sprint again. 
And then I did uh, nationals at the end of the year, 2015. Uh, and that was uh, yeah quite good. I won uh, the uh, I won the kilo and I won the sprint, and I was just uh, beating uh, the guys from the national team. And I was like, okay. Uh, I said to Rene uh, Wolf, um, is it possible I can, um, uh, yeah, I can do World Cup or something, or is it uh, possible I can go to Olympics? And he said, yeah, you have to ride the uh, uh, World Cup first. And then World Championships, and then we see. And uh, World Cup we did in Hong Kong. Um, so I got the points there, and then I did Worlds in London. I got second in kilo, which was good enough for him to continue. And then we had a we had a trial before uh, Rio, and uh, yeah, I, there I qualified myself for uh, for the team sprint and also sprint and Kirin. Where, where did the motivation come from to? to stop road cycling but still stay in cycling because you think for a lot of people if they're if they've done track cycling before they end up doing road cycling they'd probably just call it a day but what made you continue i don't know i think the love for the sport um and um yeah it's just uh very enjoyable to to train and to to ride races on the track um and also i got an invitation for the kirin in japan to do uh, yeah to race there and that that's also something I really enjoy doing and uh, yeah so uh, actually uh, yeah I still have a quite a nice life as a as a track cyclist. Do you find the training um a lot easier on the track than compared to the road? Well, it's it's yeah I think it's easier in the end. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but it's. Mm, on the, on, on the other hand, it can be also more difficult, you know, if you have certain targets in training, for example, in the gym, uh, yeah, you can push yourself and it can be really hard also, you know. Mm. I uh, think it's, men it's mentally probably tougher because you get timed every single training session and you try to beat your, your time, but on the road, I guess you can just ride around for five hours and, you know, yeah. think about something else. Yeah, but, yeah, but also that's not the case anymore on the road. Like, you don't yeah. do... Uh, not many riders that you just do five hours uh, Grundlager but uh, <laughs> uh, you know also on the road they have like yeah, a lot of efforts and yeah, yeah. Uh, stuff like that it's uh, not that simple anymore uh, how was it um, how was it coming back into the Dutch team with having uh, Venny Wolf as your coach because you would have ridden against him back in the day when you left track cycling was it a bit strange to have one of your competitors coaching you um, yeah, he was, uh, uh, yeah, he was always a very good rider and, um, also he was a very smart rider, like tactically and yeah, he always knew what he was doing and he always had a plan. And, uh, when I left uh, the track, he came as a national coach to the, to the Dutch team and, uh, yeah, basically he continued building uh, what was already there, you know, and continued developing uh, young riders. Um, so yeah, it was quite nice that he got much more structure into the into the national team than when I left. But I want to talk about so what what's kind of kept you going, and you touched on on Japan, um, kind of keeping you going. And um, so to explain for everyone that's listening at home, uh, track cycling in Japan, specifically Keelan, is uh, is professional. It's a bit like kind of greyhound racing or horse racing. Um, punters come along and place bets on you and things like that. Um, but you seem to really kind of thrive out there in Japan with the other nationalities um, from around the world. Why, why do you love Japan so much? And, and what, do you, what do you think? Why do you think it keeps you going? Um, yeah, it's nice to make money also with cycling. <laughs> 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 so, uh, yeah, I go there uh, like... Uh, uh, yeah, in the middle of, or in between Olympics, I go there. Uh, yeah, five six months, and uh, yeah, you do two or three Kirin races a month, and um, yeah, it's a you can earn a good salary in, in Japan, and then um, so that's a very nice aspect. But um, it's also nice that it's something similar as track cycling, but also something completely different that you ride on steel bikes or big outdoor tracks mm. and, uh, uh, yeah, you know, wearing big helmets and, uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a very nice, uh, 
uh, yeah, part of cycling, I think. And uh, it's good to to get your to keep your fitness and to yeah, develop that and, and develop your tactics um, uh, while riding a track bike. But still, yeah, it's uh, nice to go back to a wooden track again. And um, yeah, it feels uh, it feels different. You know, you feel a bit refreshed after Japan. Do you actually enjoy living out there? Because Izu, there's pretty much nothing nothing around there. And uh, no, we we try to find go out for dinner when we were out there, and there was literally nothing, nothing there apart from McDonald's. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there are some good restaurants there. Um, so yeah, when you live there, you find uh, the good places. Uh, but if you are there, yeah, a week or a couple of weeks, it's difficult to uh, yeah. to to know the area well. Um, but uh, yeah, we not we don't always stay. In uh, in Izu, we also go sometimes to Tokyo or other cities um, and explore uh, Japan a little bit. Uh, and also, when you do the races, uh, it's all over Japan. So you travel there uh, when it's far a day before, and you come to a, a city where you would n normally never come. So you get to know the country also well, and yeah, that's that's not uh, because of the races. Uh, it's not that boring. But yeah, if you if you there for a longer period, it can be a little bit boring. But uh, on the other hand, you have everything what you need for um, yeah for training and for living for your sport. You know, so you can ride on the road. Uh, you have a lot of tracks. Um, yeah, you have uh, a good gym there. So yeah, you can do whatever you want. Do you um, do you still find it weird in Japan? Um, so basically, like you know, we always hear from guys who come back saying that like it's it's bonkers. Like you're you're put in isolation before the race, so you can't fix the betting. You have to say what gears you're going to ride. You have to announce your tactics. Do you still find it strange, or do you think you've got used to it? Do you feel more part of the culture? Uh yeah, it's uh, yeah for for us, it's not really strange anymore. Um, and you understand uh, why they all take all these. Uh, uh, measurements, um, uh, measures, I think, <laughs> I have to say. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's especially when you do your first race and you hand over your mobile phone, that's always a moment that's a little bit difficult. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and especially the first day, yeah, you're so used to have a mobile phone with you. Um, you know, when you go to a toilet, you automatically look for your mobile phone. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, after a couple of days, you yeah, you really switch off everything and just you become really relaxed. You know, and uh, I think it's good to have yeah moments of this during the year to not be on your phone and just uh, yeah speak with people or read a book or uh, yeah something like that. And, and Phil, you said you saw some pretty interesting stuff when you were out there. You saw like guys jogging and they were like isolated and weren't allowed to visit people for the whole time they were in Cuban school. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a weird place. I think I think they're only allowed to go home for like a week a year. Is that true, Teo? Uh, like, the, like the Kieran school? Yeah, I think, I, I think they can go back home during the weekend, but uh, everybody stays at the Kieran school. And yeah. Uh, yeah, still at the Kieran, the students. So at the Kieran school, the students they yeah they have to follow uh, a lot of rules. So they have to shave their head, for example. Yeah. Uh, the girls have to cut cut their hair. Uh, it's like a, a military base camp, basically a military uh, education on the bike, basically. Yeah. So you can see it like that. It's very strict. And, uh, in the weekend, they can go go back home, but everybody always staying. And they, they also have the hand over their phones there, so they don't have a mobile phone. Oh wow. Yeah, they have week. like they have like pay yeah. phones in the reception of the Kieran school and like three computers where they I think they can access the internet. Yeah. That's all we were yeah. allowed to see as well. You weren't allowed to see like how they live or anything. It was quite strict. It was very interesting. It's like a different world. Hmm. And um, so let, let's move on to kind of like the, the final bit, which is more kind of like what's happening these days. So um, I want to ask a little bit about, um, you know, beat cycling team and the decision with the UCI and the trade teams and things like that. Um, and then also kind of how the Dutch are looking for Tokyo 2021 um, and how the delay affects you guys. 
Um, yeah, there are a lot of question marks still with the current situation. Um, I think it's good uh, that uh, that it's postponed. It was a little bit crazy that they waited so long for it. Um, and for Beat, uh, yeah, we still don't know exactly what they're going to do um, with commercial teams during the World Cups or the Nation League. So that's also still a question mark. Um, but yeah, it looked like um, that they were going to allow uh, a trade team again. But yeah, it's not 100% sure. Um, and also, yeah, for the for the Olympics, yeah, I was I'm really wondering what they will do with the calendar. You know, uh, um, will there? Yeah, when will the races be? And nobody really knows at the moment. Yeah. Uh, so it's quite difficult to make a plan already towards the Olympics for everyone. Yeah. So it's a very very crazy situation at the moment. Mm. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's chaos. Yeah, and and obviously it's it it's maybe not the best time for the Dutch because they've got such amazing form across many disciplines, but probably most most notably the team sprint where they're a good bit ahead of of Phil. Sorry, Phil, um, not me. But... <laughs> <laughs> I haven't ridden. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but do you, do you believe that those guys uh, will be able to hang on um, to that gap that they have ahead of the British, um, even though it's going to be another year towards towards Tokyo? Yeah, I think it uh, uh, can be beneficial for the British riders, of course, because uh, yeah, the gap was pretty big uh, at the last World Championships, and um, yeah, uh, of course, uh, everybody is beatable, but. Uh, yeah, I think it was one second in the final, or at the both fastest times, mm. and that's uh, it's a it's a big gap for a couple of months to to cover. Um, so I think it's good for the British; they have some more time to uh, work on that, you know. Thanks. Um, <laughs> and and uh, yeah, the Dutch, uh, yeah, they they are ahead, and uh, they have to stay ahead, and uh, also think uh, wisely what they can do to improve, to keep improving, to keep the gap. So, uh, yeah. Uh, what do the Dutch... I think both nice. What do the Dutch do now to, that they're going so fast? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> no, they're, just, they're just training uh, normal... Uh, yeah, uh, it surprised me also a lot. Yeah. Uh, it's very talented you know, uh, riders in there. Yeah, talented riders. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, good good structure in the team. Uh, everybody knows what they must do to be at their best. Um, um, and but yeah, still at the Worlds in uh, in Berlin, the time was amazing what they did in the in team sprint. Mm. Uh, I thought I thought maybe they're gonna do they're just gonna make a, almost a world record, just you know like forty one eight or something. I had that in my my head. Um, and uh, yeah, when you write down the times, what you think they were going to write, um, yeah, and what they did, it's just uh, so much faster, you know. Mm. I never expected that. Do you think we're starting to see the the ideal body type for splinting? Um, so I guess in my head, it seems like you know a lot of guys like uh, you know Kevin Saru, Matt Crampton, Chris Hoy, you know the slightly taller guys, slightly thinner are being replaced by guys who are a little bit smaller and built like houses, basically? Um, yeah, it's it's hard to say. It's hard to say. Um, I hope not, because I'm 1 meter 90. That's, yeah. not, a, <laughs> that's not a good thing. Uh, but yeah, if you if you look at all the things that can be, uh, can be good for a team sprint, for example, you have to be light, um, and you have to produce a lot of watts, and uh, you have you have to be also smaller to be aero. Um, yeah, it, I can understand that uh, that when you're a bit smaller, uh, it uh, it can be beneficial. But uh, yeah, like I said, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> we still got Matt Glazer in there. He's pretty tall and pretty fast. So there's there's a few tall guys holding out there. Um, I was I was gonna say you know in uh, 2008 you said you know the pressure of the moment got a bit much and that was maybe a time where you felt like there was someone older in the team to be able to help you. 
are you finding yourself having a bit of a role within the team because you're such an experienced leader helping out the younger guys that are there with the pressure that's coming because obviously there's a lot of pressure leading up to 2021 because everyone expects them to win gold yeah um yeah i just i just the only thing what what i do i don't want to be their mental coach or something and i also cannot be their mental coach but um yeah what i just do is just tell them uh, my stories what happened to me you know in the past and uh what i did well and what i did wrong um and that's only the those experience i can share um but you know they have a lot of experience themselves already and um yeah and they have a lot of, a lot of knowledge already uh, you know by themselves um and also yeah if you just look at the pressure they have uh, they seem to cope really well with it and uh yeah they handle it really well for example Harry Lafreisen yeah he, he always delivers uh you know what he wants um yeah it doesn't seem he, he he has difficulties with the pressure you know but yeah there are always guys uh yeah and and especially at the olympics can be something else you know mm. um but yeah the only thing i can do or i want to do is just uh yeah tell some old stories if they want to hear it you know if they ask for it <laughs> you can tell them how hard it was back in the day that's what chris says to us all the time yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I think I think it'd be good to just uh, start winding up the podcast, but we always give people um, an opportunity at the end to plug what they want. So if you want people to follow you on social media, or follow Beat Cycling Team, you can basically say what you want now. Yeah, follow Beat Cycling Club on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually got a question. And follow, and follow me on Instagram. Yeah. What's I, what's I um. What's what's next for you? Are you gonna keep going after these Olympics, or um, you gonna after the Olympics? Yes. Uh, I I don't know. I just see it uh, day by day, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It could be next week. <laughs> I I wake up. Maybe tomorrow I wake up. I want to quit. Then I quit. You know. Yeah. <laughs> Fair I enough. No idea. What about you guys? What am I doing? I, I'm retired, mate. I don't know what you know. <laughs> but you, you can make a, you can make a comeback now. Eh? You have time enough. <laughs> I would, but um, I had a crash the other day on my bike, and uh, I think I might need surgery on my knee, so I'm out for a little while. Okay. Yeah. okay. Phil, are you going to make a comeback? Well, it's a year to go. It's 60 months to go, isn't it? So I'm going to try my best. You know, I thought, um, you know, I'm the reserve at the moment, but a year and a half a lot can change so um yeah. i try my best and i want to be the best yeah. reserve i can be as well if i still end up as a reserve so um mm. yeah try my best so there, there will be like a qualification moment still for you guys or is this just a team is um, already known i don't really know what's going to happen they've postponed the selection olympic selection but um yeah I don't think anyone knows at the moment what's going to happen, to be honest. Okay, yeah. So we'll stay tuned to find out how Phil gets on and if Theo boss the tires tomorrow. Um. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you very much, guys. It's been a pleasure. And uh, tune in next week. Cheers. All right. Cheers. Thank you. Ciao.